Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here at my next Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video. And this is going to be a look back on Legend of Korra Turf Wars Part 1. It's been enough time, I think, since the book has been released that it's time to kind of look back on this. We're, we're away from the initial hype, all of the interviews have kind of calmed down about Part 1. And it's, I think, time to just reflect on this book as just like, it is just another book now. How actually is it? Was I did it, do I has have my opinions advanced since my initial reviews and so on? So getting straight into it, like I think the main thing to say is that overall the book has been a success in terms of sales. Absolutely, this thing has been a huge bestseller for Dark Horse. That's been very clear, um, and I think for the most part the response to the book has been fairly positive. I think it's a little bit. I, I think the response is a little bit misleading in that. I think a large part of it is a lot of Korra Sami hype with very, very few people within the, the fandom and a very few people who are... A, very, a lot of people really only talking about the Korra Sami stuff in the book. There's a lot of big review sites out there who covered the book who only really mentioned the Korra Sami stuff without mentioning any of the actual plot points. Um, and so I think it's this weird thing of like I feel now going into part two and three where I think we suspect we won't get as much Korra and Asami's focus. It'll be there but it won't be as heavy as this book. I think we may start to see the hype for Turf Wars calm down now. Um, a lot of that depends on how much they market part two and part three because usually Dark Horse tend to just let part two and three just come out with very little hype around them. Maybe they'll change that for Turf Wars seeing how popular part one was but um, it's hard to say right now. Um, so the fan response, as I said, somewhat misleading because the discussion about the plot points, I thought, I, in my experience, rarely really came up. And I think when you break it down, that there was a significant portion of the fandom who had some issues even with the core Sammy stuff, which was the most praised. And then you add in all the plot points, which I think is probably the weakest part of this book, just the balance of just way too much core Sammy, far, far too little plot point stuff, to the point where the main villain is kind of a non-event, just a non-character at this stage. We know nothing about him. The other new character, Wan Yang Kun, we barely know anything about him. The big, big plot point of the human spirit and um, conflict and the new spirit portal, given very little time for being such an important plot point within the series, like the biggest one that is left wide open. How is Korra going to approach dealing with this issue? In that she has more or less pledged as of book two to tackle this issue, that she's going to try and fix things to a way where maybe there can be some progress made between humans and spirits, and that really didn't get the treatment it deserved. And then there's a lot of other stuff going on. There is a lot of plot points in this book, and that's why I'm very surprised that there was so little discussion around most of these plot points. Um, Raiko and the presidency, um, I was shocked that they did nothing really in this book to kind of directly set up Zhu Li as being his opponent, as we know from the part two description. Like, they presented her as being organized, but they never really did enough to just immediately have you go really confident out of this book that, yeah, Zhu Li's going to run against Raiko. They just didn't go that far, and I'm I'm surprised that they didn't. Um, I don't get why that happened. Um, as I said, like Tokuga and the whole triad stuff. I think I thought they brushed past the whole history of what happened about like, oh yeah, all these triads are just gone. They're just part of the triple threats now. I thought that was a very weak way to kind of uh, not have any world building happen. Of just like, oh yeah, all these really interesting triads that are all unique and individual. They're all just part of the triple threat now because of this guy. And it's just like, okay, that's a cool thing that you can say about Tokuga, but we know nothing about him really personally. He just feels like Jet 2.0, and then he got spirit morphed at the end, and that makes him really interesting going into the next part. Um, so does this, I, th I think it's one of the few books, in, the, in terms of all the Avatar comics we've had so far, where there's just a lot where it's just like, I don't really know how to feel about it, because so little is presented about it. Because as much as there's always the defense about a series just after when we don't have the full thing of like, oh, there's still part two, there's still part three. There's still some expectations that you have to have of just a checklist of kind of things that needs to be met for a part one as an introduction to the series. 
And that's where part, Turf Wars Part 1 struggles. It, it doesn't get the balance right. It gives far too much core Sammy without presenting enough of the story. And it means Part 2 and Part 3 are now going to have to be somewhat imbalanced in like the opposite way to kind of counteract that. And that's kind of never a good position to be in, where we're going into Part 2 and 3 and we just really have no idea where the book is kind of going as such. Because even the big cliffhanger of just like kind of Tokuga's spirit morphed and he's kind of out for revenge because he's blaming Korra, even though very clearly Korra had nothing to do with what happened to him. It's just like... That's just this weird thing where we as the audience know that there's like very little personally between the two of them, yet it's the main villain arc. Um, so what's that about? And then this, 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 the spirit portal is just like, okay, it's big, it's important, but like, is, is there any idea about how we're going to tackle this? Um, it just all feels like it was, it, was it, it, it didn't do enough on the plot, and it was just too much on... The Korra and Asami relationship, which I get why it was a focus upon, and I get why they hyped up this book completely based on it, and it led to a lot of sales. But it's also a case of like, for the people who aren't super super into Korra Asami, and would praise the book just for having Korra Asami, it meant that like there was a large part of this book where it was just like, okay, cool, this relationship, it's fine. Um, because actually, I haven't really seen anyone criticize this book so much that like. They dislike the whole book because Korra and Asami are a girl-girl relationship. I really haven't seen criticisms like that. Most of the criticisms I've seen leveled up this book have been, I think, fairly valid in terms of, like, they don't like the writing of Korra and Asami's relationship for X reason. I may not agree with everything that they have to say, but some of it, I think, is completely valid. And then, on the plot side of things, absolutely, there is a lot that just is not given the attention it needs. Um, Tokuga being kind of chief among them, Won Young Kum, another c character we don't know barely anything about. But um, anyway, let's get into some specifics here. Let's let's talk about Korra and Asami uh, off the start. I think overall the book does a solid job at you know giving some depth to this relationship because it was absolutely needed. There was pretty much no way you could go into this book and not and and not in any way give any sort of a backstory on their relationship. That there was always going to be a sense of the creators having to say that, like, look, we didn't present enough of this in the show, so we have to kind of, in a way, re present some retcon here to explain this relationship and why it happens. And I think the only issue I really have with their relationship is, one, that, yes, they use a little bit too much retconning with some of this stuff with regards to, like, oh, this scene was actually really important where when you watched it initially, like, it, 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 they kind of reinterpret that scene completely in a way that, like, what is it? Asami says, like, oh, uh, you know, you were scared when we were in the race car. And Korra even says, no, I wasn't. But it's just, like, Korra wasn't scared. So, like, why are you bringing that up? And why are you creating such an importance on this scene? There's the... The line I think is probably like the, the big one for me initially is just um, I never had anyone in my life who got me the way you do. I'm just like, okay, I, I get you're trying to go, go big with this relationship. Present this connection as being extremely, extremely important to both of these girls. But you need to explain that. that the, this is the, these are the two pages of the book where they explain basically why the two of them are a couple. But within that explanation... They, they say things that themselves require explanation. Which is all a problem because you're trying to explain by retcon stuff that you didn't present in the show. Yet the way you explain them requires like showing some stuff from the show. It's just it's really a little bit awkward um, confining it all to this and trying to make it happen. Like The core is fine. I think ultimately we get to a pretty interesting point. But it's just like... Uh, I'd place so many characters above Asami in Korra's life in terms of the tier of just, like, people that get her more than anyone else. In that, like, Korra and Asami, in, like, book four, for example, didn't really spend that much time together. Um, they were barely in, like, many episodes together just because of the plot. Yet you're, you're, you're trying to present that, like, oh, you were the most important person ever in my life. And, you know, they, they try to place a lot of importance on, like, Oh, you were there for me after I got poisoned. And I'm just like, everyone 
was there for you and okay you know there was one scene of like a Sammy with Cora like in the wheelchair and she kind of held her hand for a second but it's just like would any character next to Cora in that situation not do that for her I don't think that's like an inherently like oh a Sammy moment like um it, it feels like a line where it's just like Whoa, Cora, did you forget about, like, your parents, Mako, Bolin, Tenzin, you know, Janora, the, these other characters who actually care about you as well? Just to kind of big up this relationship with Asami, it just feels a little, like, not written so well. But, you know, it, it's it's moments like that, and then um, also, like, little bits and pieces where, like, okay, there's a couple of, like, very important Cora and Asami scenes, which are fine, but then they just randomly, like, insert little bits of just, like, hey, of course, Sammy's here. And it's just like, they happen to be in the same place. They're not really doing any, anything that makes them look massively like, oh, couple moment, or like romance moment. And someone's just like, and T Tenzin just goes, um, where's the line? I think I have it here. Um, you know, oh, look look at them. They, they, they make such a good team, don't they? Um, and then Kai's just like, they sure do. And it's just like, why are you wasting two panels just to highlight something that everyone already knows? Like, you already showed a panel of Kaya noticing them. You don't need to go so far as to be like, oh, they sure do, as like, oh, Kaya, I know more than anyone else does. The, the scene with just her looking over at them did enough. Um, and especially in a scene where, like, they kind of jump past Julie. They, like, they basically present the Korasami sitting next to each other stuff as being in a more important thing than setting up Julie as being potentially the next president of Republic City. And it just, it, it's a little moments like that where, like, there's just needless, like, relationship moments um, that happen. Uh, then, like, the, the Kaya scene that happens later on, as I've said before, um, it's probably one of the more controversial things that seem to be in terms of, like, people disagreeing with me. But I still don't like the whole Sozin thing that they just say that he was, the, he's the only, the only named character in the entire book who's, like, homophobic is Sozin. And in a book where they mentioned the line, like, not everyone will be as understanding of your relationship as we or I will. Where they mentioned that line, like, three or four times. Who are you talking about? Sozin is the only person you ever say in the whole book who actually doesn't like these type of relationships. And I, I don't like how they just give no explanation for the whole Sozin thing. That they feel no need to justify, like, saying that. Um, or explaining why he went from the type of villain that he was to now being this type of villain. I, I, I ultimately don't have a problem like if they just decide that, okay, this is the thing they want to add to Susan's character, but you have to explain it and justify it. I, I, I don't like that they've basically just added this on to like the list of other bad things that he did. Um, in part because I kind of, in a way, don't see Susan as that type of villain. Like, you look at his arc, like, watch Avatar and the Fire Lord, and then read that line about Sozin. And I, I get a disconnect, for sure, between, like, the way he's presented in one versus the way he's presented in the other. In that I think Sozin, even though he is probably the, one of the most evil characters in the show, with regards to, like, the Aeronoma genocide and leaving Roku for dead, he's meant to be a somewhat understandable villain because, like... He fundamentally just thinks that, like, I want to spread the, the wealth of the Fire Nation to the rest of the world, and he saw Sozin is getting in his way, and then his main enemy was the Avatar. I don't see where, like, a personal hatred of people in same-sex relationships comes in, and what that adds or, like, doesn't add or whatever to his character. So, the way it comes across is just that, like, oh, we haven't actually said anyone who's against these type of relationships, who will we do? Uh, and then uh, there's this sense of like, they are utterly terrified of making any character not be supportive of their relationship because they know that that character will then become extremely, extremely hated. That they can't have, say, um, like, who, who for example, like, they couldn't have a Tenzin come in and be like, oh, what's this type of relationship and be against it. Because people would then hate Tenzin. It immediately turns them around on his character, despite all the other good things about him. So they added only on to the character who is, you know, irredeemable. Sozin. And I don't like that, that it's just this very thoughtless, like, you can't disagree with us because he's the main villain character type of dynamic. Um, what about one of the other Earth Kings? 
that they, they are, they've all been established to do bad things in the past. I would be completely understanding if the 46th Earth King was someone who didn't like these type of relationships. And that added into the whole Kyoshi opposing him, given what they reveal about Kyoshi here. That would be a perfect character to add that onto, the, 30, the 46th Earth King. And note how maybe one, one thing that Quay did was maybe change that or something like that. That would have been like, okay. You could have even have said it like with, with any of the other characters. Um, I would have been okay if it was like Ozai or Azulon to some degree who did that, but just adding it onto Sozin, it's just like no, no. That is a uh, for me. I I, I put that in, down as poor writing, and um, really really dislike that as being a thing that now we have to always like talk about with Sozin. Um, I really don't like that. Um, so there's that. Um, then, uh, with regards to other stuff, I suppose we're still on Korra and Asami. The other thing I want to talk about with Korra and Asami. As I said, overall, I think it's it's positive that, like, I come out of this book being like, okay, I, I, I get these two. I, it's not my favorite relationship. Uh, I don't think it's the best, most well-written, but it's it's perfectly fine. L like I said at the end of, like, the my, like, Last Stand episode review, uh, and I've been very consistent on this from the start. I'm just like, I have no problem with this relationship. I, I'm going to, I'm completely on board with this, depending on how they present it. And I thought, and as I've said here, it's been presented pretty okay. And so I think it's a pretty okay relationship. It's not my favorite. It's not my most hated. It's just like another solid relationship that's there. Um, the, uh, the problem though, is I think a big thing that I've, I've come to the conclusion on Rewatching more episodes of Korra with the podcast, rereading this book again, Asami is not on the same level of a character as Korra. And so it makes the relationship feel extremely, extremely lopsided. That we know everything about Korra. We've seen her journey through all of the books, all of these personal arcs and things we've experienced with her. Whereas um, with Asami, the only things we know are like the stuff that relates to her father and like she can drive, she's a good engineer. And that's about it. Like it's it, it, it's all stuff that's kind of in a way not about who she is as a person. And that's what we still haven't to this day I think got with, with Asami. That moment where we truly understand who she is. Because what they do in this book is they kind of present that like okay Kor is being a bit too impulsive about this relationship. So that's kind of Korra's flaw within the relationship, but kind of Asami calls her out to a degree on it for being a little bit overly intense and skipping over Asami's feelings. What about Asami's weaknesses? What about Asami's flaws as a character? I don't know what they are. Does Korra know what they are? What are Korra's challenges within this relationship having to deal with Asami, given that you've presented Asami's problems within the relationship having to deal with Korra? Um, that's what they didn't do here and what they need to do going forward. I think there's a little bit of setup in this book for something along those lines that I think Korra and Asami may end up on opposite sides of how to deal with the spirit portal issue because it's clear Korra to some degree wants a level of openness between humans and spirits. She doesn't want to lock them apart or create too big of a restriction going either way between the world. Whereas Asami does say something in this book along the lines of like people like you shouldn't be allowed in they, we have to kind of keep them separate and like only f some certain people can go in. Like she wants to be very, very selective about this thing. And you could sort of see the problems with that for, for Korra and her ideals and how she wants to uh, tackle this as the avatar. In that Korra has this kind of opinion in between Wan Young Kum and Asami. And she feels that's the correct way to do things in terms of cr m creating like a respectful park nature type area surrounding the new spirit portal and kind of being like okay people can come in and come out we're not like locking it down or anything like that but we're also not just like opening it up as just like a free-for-all type situation that there has to be respect here and I, and, and, I, and I like that the only thing is getting into the spirit uh, human conflict is that I don't I think they have a lot of work to do on that plot as I said before I think it's the biggest plot left in the whole book and the whole core series. Probably the Avatar universe is the biggest plot that's left. The dealing with this conflict that's been an issue since Wan's time, before Wan's time. Humans and spirits have more or less never got on as far as, we, as, far as we've been aware. And Korra 
in her book two speech, in her speech here, one of the things that she has left to do as the Avatar after the end of the series is deal with the human spirit conflict. And it's and I've, I've always felt that like the way they presented Korra with regards to the spirit stuff, that she is going to be a character who makes a significant change with regard to the relationship between the two different species of being. Um, in that that's that's that feels like it's going to be one of her big legacies as the Avatar. Not just that she opened up the spirit portals, but that she actually affected a change between the two species. I hope we get to that stage, but uh, after the pre presentation in part one, I'm struggling to see how in two more books we're going to get make any progress on that front, because it kind of feels like, okay, we're dealing with this dragon spirit here, but who is this dragon spirit? Why does he speak for the other spirits? Like... I'd understand it if it was like a Wanchi Tong, someone who has issues in the past with humans. Him talking to Korra and maybe representing all spirits' views on the subject would be fine. But this random dragon spirit doesn't feel like a particularly important character because they've never presented him as a character. We're not really getting the spirit opinion on things all that much because the spirit opinion on things is so lopsided in their favor it makes them look terrible that at least some humans are trying with the spirits trying to be you know you know friendly with them the spirits seem to just be allowed to come into the physical world but humans are in trouble the second they go into the spirit world a completely uneven and unbalanced situation and that needs to be something that is explained why is that the case why did this why did the spirits feel a level of like ownership, I suppose, over the physical world, even though their world is the spirit world? Um, there needs to be that, that sense of like, you know, the line turtles, they did what they had to do because you basically locked down humans in line turtle cities. You didn't let them have their own, you know, home. You didn't let them, you know, get food, uh, hunt animals. Um, even though it's their land, they're, they're, it's physical beings and stuff like that. Like, there, there has to be some sort of an explanation that comes out for, like, what's going on. Like, it kind of explain, basically, the, the spirit's connection to nature, the spirit's connection to the physical world in the first place. I think the, the, the going theory within the lore community, within Avatar, is that you kind of almost have to assume that spirits fundamentally helped shape the physical world into what it is to allow it to be able to... Um, you know, hold physical life. Um, but again, the line turtles are a different factor there because they seem to be physical beings that exist uh, exist at the same time as like the early spirits in that Rava calls the line turtles like an ancient one. Um, so that's something that needs to be explained as well. And this is where like, this Turf Wars could be awesome. If we get l l good lore content about the spirits and the spirit portals and the dynamic between the two species, that could be really really good but the presentation here again i thought was very underwhelming because it's 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 all written in this really weird way where it's all about drama it's like uh the, it's just the, the the dragon spirit asks cora like okay we'll leave you just make sure to protect protect this new spirit portal we have a huge problem with this third spirit portal right in the middle of a city you protect it she gets called by Janora to protect it by the end of the book because Tokuga is attacking. She is protecting it. No one's getting through, but the spirits still come out and attack. Like, oh, you've broken our deal. Uh, no, she hasn't. She's fighting in front of the portal to protect you. What's going on here? You broke the deal, spirit. Are you an idiot? And it, it really makes you feel that way, that either the spirits are just completely just unreasonable or they're just idiots. And it's, it's, it's hard to know which way to take them. And that's the presentation that we've been getting of spirits so far. That basically since book two, the presentation of spirits has been overall, overall fairly weak outside of like Rava, basically. Um, and they need to improve that drastically because it feels like the fandom is more making a bigger deal about the spirit portals than the writers and the people behind the scenes working on this are. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then I suppose the other plot points of like... Um, Raiko as the president. The only thing I'll say on that is very similar to what I said before. Is just I find it a bit weird that they're going really overboard with just saying how bad of a president Raiko is. That they're just presenting nothing good about him, and like anyone could run against him and win. And I'm kind of like, okay, 
have you just given up on the character? Are you done with him now? We're just immediately moving to like President Zhu Li going forward. Or once she reveals her campaign plan and maybe she has ideals or views that people don't disagree don't agree with, maybe then some of Raiko's good points will come out. I'm not really sure because it's been so like, wow, no one likes Raiko, he's making all the wrong decisions, he's just a really selfish person. Like, okay. Is he just bad? Are we just meant to hate him? Is he just meant to be this character that he's not particularly likable or, or what? So I, I'm, I'm intrigued to see where they go with it there, but I'm I'm unsure if it's just really kind of blunt in one way writing or if it's actually setting up something more. I'm not I'm not really sure what way to take it. Um, equally, I think one of the other things that I hope isn't an issue is Mako's reaction to Kor and Asami's relationship. I hope it was just a joke. I hope it was literally just the joke of just like, haha, Mako is the one person who is kind of a bit shocked by their relationship and because of his connection to the two of them. Okay, let's have him have this kind of slightly odd reaction here and let's move on. I hope it's as simple as that or that maybe sometime in part two or three, he just has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the girls and they just get out the little awkwardness that they all have with each other and we move on. This does not need to be made into a bigger issue. I hope they're not trying to present some sort of a way where like Mako is like against their relationship somehow. Thankfully the dialogue does have him say that like he's cool with it, but it's all like in between pauses with like a weird look in his face and stuff like that, which doesn't help. But he's a character who has suffered heavily the past couple of seasons and in this comic for, you know, basically mistakes made by the writers and then the writers have basically used him as the fall guy for their bad writing and they need to basically improve that going forward. I hope they give Mako a big thing going forward. I'd like to see his arm get healed fairly soon. I'd like to see him really be presented as the impressive you know, member of the police force that he is and have him have some big moments and set him up as like potentially the next chief of police. I think you need to go that far and then maybe we can get into like the, you know, the, the skip plots from the show of just like, oh, let's set him up with President Azumi's daughter. That's his relationship going forward. That's the Mako endgame relationship is with the, the princess of the Fire Nation. That would be a cool thing just to, to, to give to Mako. I've always liked that idea. If you're going to explore the Fire Nation in Korra time at some point, why not have that little relationship come up. Give Mako something, a relationship that can just be positive for Mako instead of Mako always being involved in the relationship drama stuff. Um, so there's that. Um, what else um, do we have here? You know, there's, there's great moments. Like I, I really do like the Korra and Asami going to uh, Korra's parents uh, moment. That's really well done. I, As I said, beyond the Sozin line, I love the, the Kaya and... Um, Kor and Asami scene, just her kind of uh, experience in these matters and kind of giving the girls that kind of confidence when they were maybe like a bit unsure about how how their relationship was going to be seen and her just kind of giving the full rundown of kind of how each nation kind of views these type of relationships. Like, I thought that was that was that was overall well done. It's it is just stuff like Tokuga being a non-entity as a character, just very uninspired, uncreative, just like, oh he has hook swords, he's jet. No way, he's Tokuga. And then, like, I think the cliffhanger has very little impact. Just like, wait, why, 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 are we, why are we meant to interpret that? The two villain characters who kind of have the same goals in the first place are now actually, like, together, but Tokuga's in charge now versus Wan Yong Kum. And he's out for revenge for, as I said before, like, reasons that are extremely nebulous that he's interpreting Korra as sending spirits after him and now he's after Korra. What? I, I'm assuming that... In, Come the end, Tokuga's plan will basically be he hates spirits, he's going to try and ruin the spirit, human spirit conflict, and as Korra is trying to fix it. And that's going to be a big, big point. Hopefully, through him, we learn what it, what it really means to be spirit morphed and what it does to you and why the spirits do that in the first place. That would be a cool thing if they properly get into that. But, you know, as I said, right now, very, very vague exploration at the moment no real depth gone into um but uh, yeah I, th I think i'm gonna leave it there they're my kind of initial thoughts reading the book for the first time in a while i i pretty much stand by most of what i said before i think this book is a 6.5 out of 10 it is average and that's fine like it's not bad i i think i think 
for me, like when I see reviews trying to make it out that the book is just awful, like that's maybe when I'm like, mm, not really. Like it's still enjoyable. It's still Avatar. It's still the characters we care about, um, and some of the plots are interesting. It's just the focus is all over the place. Some of the writing isn't the best. I think some of the art is a little bit inconsistent, but when it's good, it is very good. Um, and I, and I, I think it's a similar problem to North and South, where the biggest problem is probably just that right now, it's not a particularly notable book. There's not a huge takeaway. Like, as I said before, if you don't care massively about Korosami, if you're just like, if you just accept it and treat it just as another, another relationship in the show, it's not one that you necessarily ship really hard yourself. It's just... It's just another book. Like there's there's nothing overly important to it. They're like, okay, presidential elections coming up, cool. Some triad stuff going on. The spirit portal is the only real big thing, but they present it. They give it so, such little time. It doesn't feel that important. You know, there's not a huge thing. Kind of like North and South, where we thought the return to the South would be this notable thing. We get all these important dynamics. We got a little bit, but not all that much. The book, the comics, I think, do need to return to presenting more notable storytelling where we actually cover big things that we care about. But, um, you know, as I said, 6.5, pretty much around in the middle, leaning more towards, like, it being, like, relatively solid, pretty good as a book. But there needs to be big improvements, I do think. So that's my thoughts on the book. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on the book, you know. As I said, and it, from a similar perspective to mine, like, have you gone back to the book since it's come out? What are your thoughts on it now that the hype has died down? Uh, and so on. Uh, how excited are you for the remainder? I think one of the big things is just the timing on a lot of this is really not great. Just the delays and how late the book came out. But there's st we still have to wait until January for the next part. And then who knows when for part three. It's just a really, really long wait. And then... Hopefully we'll get Avatar comic news coming up soon. But uh, yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.